base has dropped on a sunny Tuesday morning in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome. Soccer down here. Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show for March 5th. If you want to get in on some Tuesday Thoughts, tweet at us, at Soccer Down Here. I'm Jason Longshore. John Nelson's here right now, but we got lots of people chiming in today as we go, John. We've got Mike Conti calling in from Monterey, Mexico. He's on the uh, nice. the advanced scouting group. I'll be joining yes. him tonight, uh, probably getting into the hotel eh, around 10 o'clock our time, maybe a little bit later than that, depending on how long it takes from airport to hotel and customs. customs. Oh, yeah, it might be later than that. So <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> a long day of travel. Um heading down to Monterey, but I'll be doing that later today. Mike's already there. We'll get the lay of the land from him. Joe Patrick joins us at 10 o'clock for his usual weekly check-in. And then Jason Wright, the commissioner of our soccer down here, MLS Fantasy League, calls in at 1030 to tell us why he's beating all of us. Yeah, for real. Because, you know, we needed that to be rubbed in. Um, if you are not part of the Fantasy League, you can still join. It's easy. Uh, follow the instructions at Jason Wright, A-G-E-N, on Twitter. Uh, Soccer Down Here has tweeted this many times as well. We'll continue to we'll continue. form to fill uh-huh. out because there will be prizes to win and have to get all the uh, the legalities done so you can win prizes. Those are coming. But get in the league so you can join us. Last year was a lot of fun, lots of trash talking. Uh, this year, if Jason Wright beats us all, he'll be talking trash to us every week. And that will be Much sad. like this week. Yes. So get in the league so we can beat the commissioner. We need to do this. Lots of stuff going on. Um, CONCACAF Champions League returns tonight. And my travel was hopefully will be great compared to Santos Laguna. Oof. Santos Laguna was traveling from Guadalajara yesterday. Their flight was canceled into either New York or Newark. Not sure where, but all of the storms that were starting to hit caused that flight to get canceled. So they had to completely scramble different groups up there. I believe everybody arrived at some point in the day and evening yesterday. I haven't seen an update, but they were having to find random different flights to get everybody into town. They play tonight. They play the Red Bulls at Red Bull Arena tonight. That's going to add a little bit of complication to it. Um, They're also coming off of a a bad weekend in Liga MX as well. They had a big loss over the weekend. So Santos Laguna, I'm curious about this one. Red Bull's getting them first. Red Bull's might be able to take advantage. Yeah, and that was what popped into my head with all of the travel madness and the weekend that they had right now in Liga MX, they're in the hashtag gaggle for fifth, sixth, seventh, but they're sixth on goal difference. But, you know, once again, you're a win out of fourth and all that kind of stuff. So you, you look at the, the no good, very bad travel day that they had yesterday, and it goes into that category five of intangibles, getting ready for a match and how prepared are they for cold weather, how motivated are they after all of the flight shenanigans. This, I think, is the Red Bull's opportunity to, to get out there and get out in front and make sure that uh, Santos Laguna has their work cut out for them for the reverse leg. You know, th- this one for me is the the one that you sit there and you circle and highlight and check as that that opportunity out of the blocks. It's a big opportunity. Kamar Lawrence is listed as day to day. That will hurt the Red Bulls a little bit, but you need to strike while you have the opportunity, and especially in the first leg. So, Red Bulls tonight. I'll be keeping an eye on how aggressive they are going for this. I think they need to be very aggressive this evening to see what they can get out of it. The other match tonight, Houston Dynamo hosting Tigres of Monterey. And kind of interesting, the Dynamo and their attendance issues, we've talked about it. It needs to get better. It's definitely not where it needs to be. They sold the on-camera side of the stadium to Tigres fans, and it's nearly sold out. Oops. No, not oops. <laughs> there, there's no oops. Why would there be oops? They did that on purpose because they wanted it to be full. Except it's going to be full of the opposing team's fans. That's what I'm TV. saying. It's going to but be full, but on camera you're going to be seeing the opposing team. Well, what that was my rather, oops. There's no oops though. It was intentional. Oops would be an accident. This was done intentionally because they don't trust that their own fans are going to fill it up. Uh, and I don't think they're wrong. Like that's the thing is I don't think they're wrong. 
and that's, that's disappointing. Sad. Well, yeah. Owen Coyle really ruined the. Uh, the Thanks, Houston Owen Coyle. Base. I really still put a lot of it on that, but it's 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 so far past that now. It's got to change, and I don't know if this is a fan base slow to come back around. If it is a team not marketing well, it's probably somewhere in between. Um, it has to change because this is a good, fun team to watch. They're in a quarterfinal series against T Grace, and they're going to get shouted down in their own building. And I think the, yeah. the players and the the technical staff know that and are expecting it tonight. Oh, and uh, skipping back to the the previous matchup that we're discussing. Yes. According to our friends at Weather dot com, twenty five degrees, eleven mile an hour winds. Oof. That's your forecast at uh, in Harrison, New Jersey. Oof. Should be slightly warmer in Houston, but uh, not warm. You know, uh, it's not going to no. be warm in Houston. That's for warmer. Sure. Yeah, but and it's a relative term. But no, it's. I think that the watching this match on, on television last night uh, t- tonight in Houston, I think it's it's going to be an interesting. Uh, it's going to be an interesting TV experiment just to to hear what it's like to be shouted down in your own building, and I think it's going to make for great pictures and great visuals. Uh, once again, it speaks more to what Houston isn't doing is to, you know, tipping your hat to all the Tigres fans who are making the trip. But, um, yeah, obviously it's disappointing from a home team perspective and I'm looking forward to seeing what it looks like and how it translates on TV tonight. It's 31 degrees in Houston right now. That is very atypical. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. um, Tuca Ferretti had the uh, the parka on. I, I'd have the parka on, too. People were trying to make fun of Tuca always bundling up when it's cold. I'd be freezing as myself. Uh, it looks like at game time, it could be 44, 43 degrees. Um, it's not going to be pleasant. 12 miles an hour wind. It's going to be cold in Monterey. <laughs> it's going to be yeah. in the, uh, I think the mid-50s when we kick off tomorrow is the plan. Not all that typical. It's just one of those weird things. This happens, so you got to deal. Won't be DC though. No, it won't be DC. It'll feel tropical compared to DC. <laughs> we'll see how weather affects these games tonight um, across all fronts. We'll see how the crowds affect it. We'll see what the crowd looks like at Red Bull Arena. I, if that's the conditions you're looking at, I think it's going to be quite sparse at Red Bull Arena yes. tonight. I hope. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but that's kind of what I'm expecting. Yeah, I think there will be more people in the concourse huddled around hot coffee and hot chocolate and hot food than there will be actually watching the match outside if there's going to be that many people there in the first place. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Um, what are you thinking in these two games? The MLS teams get the, the home legs first. Uh, the only MLS team to ever advance when the second leg is in Mexico uh, happened in the last round, sporting Kansas City over Toluca, when Toluca is a far weaker team than either one of these. Uh, what do you have to do in the first leg? I mean, if you're Houston, if you're the Red Bulls, two-goal win? Is that kind of your minimum yeah. target here? Yeah, I think so. I think that – and making sure that that road goal doesn't pop up on the board. Uh, you know, for for me – it's it's two nils, um, because if it's three one, we all know what happens at three one. Yeah, we have we have the the current example of what lays out at three one. But Santos Laguna and Tigres, you know, no offense to Arediano, but they're they're tougher, tighter squads. Uh, it's it's got to you got to keep that road goal off the board. So by default, for me, it would be two nil both across the board. Minimum, yeah, I think that's your yeah. minimum target. Uh, Red Bulls maybe a little more margin for error. I mean, Santos is not T Grace, and they're coming off of a disappointment in the league. However, and this does affect the Atlanta series, T Grace has a game in between the legs against Monterey, and that's not one that either team is really going to be able to rest players in. No. You're, you're talking one versus two in the league. You're talking the classical Regio. It's the the biggest rivalry outside of the Mexico City teams, and and not including Chivas. It's it's a huge rivalry in the world of soccer. Um, it's one that gets you know maybe overlooked at times because of Club America and Chivas, or the the rivalries in Mexico City with America and Cruz Azul and Pumas. 
but this is a massive rivalry, and I think it's become a bigger rivalry in recent years as both teams have gotten stronger and stronger and stronger, and the city of Monterey has grown too. So I think that's going to have an effect on both of the series involving Tigres and Monterey. It's going to make that second leg more difficult for them, even though it's at home, or it's at home for Tigres. Monterey has to come on the road. It's just more difficult to navigate because you're going to go, you're going to potentially rest players in the first leg because you're you're looking ahead to the league match on the weekend. I'll be curious if Tigres maybe is thinking that way a little more than Monterey. I, I think Tigres looking at Houston looks at them differently than Monterey might be looking at Atlanta United and might say, you know yeah. what, we can rest a couple guys. Yeah, I'm 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 of that same mindset too. And Shiva has the logistical question, which might be more reserved for Concacaf, wondering why we're not playing Monterey at home first. I don't know. Um, Concacaf and brackets and setup is weird. Um, I'd rather have it this way. I think this is a good thing. Um, yeah, I, I want to know what you have to do coming home. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think this is anything that's negative at all, Shiva. I would much rather have it this way because you get to go down there, and my my question going into it is going to be how defensive Atlanta United is. You know, are, are you at a point now with three games under your belt with this group that you can say, okay, we know what the the game plan is. We know what our system is. However, we're going to make a little adjustment here and we're going to play within our same system, but we're going to play in a more conservative manner. Are you comfortable enough to do that? That stuff takes time. I mean, I I think it's maybe it's just the world of of FIFA video games and football manager and that stuff where you can, you know, change a, a personality of a team with a couple clicks and you think that that's real life. Trust me, it's not. It, it takes time to build these things, and they do have a foundation to start from. You know, when you blow it up and you start over, it, you're starting completely from scratch. Frank DeBoer is not coming in starting from scratch, but he's also making some big adjustments based off the personnel that he has and the style of play that he wants to implement. And as I said last night on the show, I think in the long run, he's going to have this team in a better place than they were at the end of Tata Martino's run, where Tata went defensive in the postseason to get the results that were needed. If Frank DeBoer is able to do things the way he wants and he is successful, I don't think they're going to have to change for anybody. It's not a knock on Tata Martino at all. It's not a knock at all. He won the title. You did what you had to do to win the title. That's what you do. But in the long run, you'd like to be able to play your way every match and not be afraid of anybody. Of course, some wrinkles here and there. Of course, a little more conservative here, a little more down the right side here, a little more through the middle here. Those things are common. But in the early stages of doing that, in the early stages of learning how to play without Miguel Almiron, in the early stages of of learning how to play with P.T. Martinez, it's tough. I want to see how different Atlanta looks personality wise on the field Wednesday night I think you need to be a little more conservative especially with Monterey's strength out wide you need to be a little more conservative there are they ready to do that and do it effectively we're gonna find out that's why the schedule's tough that's why CONCACAF is a very difficult prospect for MLS teams right now because of where it falls in the schedule and the advantages that some of the opponents have because they just have more games under their belt, and it, it does add up. Yeah, and so you know, this is what you're getting into, and your schedule being staggered from everybody else's. You're having to hit the ground running where Arediano had – nine or ten matches under their belt in, in league play with yeah. uh, the opening round. And now you're looking at the the Clausura. So you're looking at nine matches played in Liga MX for Santos Laguna and Monterey and Tigres coming into this round. So distinct advantage for familiarity for Liga MX and for the Costa Rican League and for pretty much everybody else coming into this. And so you're having to sit there and adjust and figure things out, A, 
with new coach, tweaked system, slightly different personnel, and then just trying to figure out, okay, we, we're working two separate streets here. You're working Concord Cab Champions League, which helps you out with MLS regular season. So, yeah, this is this is on the job training, and this is a uh, it's, it's a tall order for MLS clubs, and especially here, the you know the one that we're discussing most of the time, Atlanta United. So, I mean, it's it's a tall order trying to figure things out, and this is, this is the the uh, the equivalent of juggling chainsaws right now. Pretty much, We've got a little bit of a uh, breaking news. A little bit of show-breaking news. Uh, remember last year when we raffled off some tickets for our friends over at Soccer in the Streets? Why, yes. We're doing that again. Uh, Andrew Baker coming through <laughs> for the kids again. The faction coming through for the kids. Hashtag for the kids. We've got a raffle that is about to go live uh, when I click send now. And it is pretty sweet it is a raffle for tickets to the home opener on sunday against cincinnati and and And? wednesday against monterey a double Mm. pack of tickets for kids thank you andrew thank you kevin and everybody at the faction for helping us facilitate and thanks to Soccer in the Streets for doing what they do. We're trying to help you do more of what you do, and hopefully this will help in some small way. Uh, it was a very good result from the raffle last time. Hopefully we can do that type of deal for the kids again this time. And you can go to at Soccer Down Here on Twitter right now and see the link that has been posted to buy your raffle tickets. All proceeds benefit Soccer in the Streets and their Metro Atlanta programs. Uh, you've seen their stuff at Station Soccer, at Marta Stations. They had 100 and I think it was 140 or 160 kids sign up for their new soccer league this spring at the West End Marta Station. Uh, first time they've done a full blown league there after that facility opened last fall. And that's a great great turnout for an area that's never had a soccer league ever like not in a long time not you know in a while ever there's never been a soccer league for that community kids who grew up in that community never had a chance to play soccer they had to go elsewhere to play now it's in their backyard so these types of of raffles and things that we do sometimes for soccer in the streets that's the type of result that you get is it's really going to benefit these kids and give them opportunities to play. You know, full disclosure, I worked for soccer in the streets and development for 10 years. I know how much $5, you know, impacts that the organization and what it can do. Programs are very cost effective. The overwhelming majority of dollars that they raise outside, of course, of your capital projects to build fields at Marta stations, which isn't cheap. Outside of that, your programming costs, your programming stuff, money that you raise, the overwhelming majority goes to actually deliver the programs. There's not a lot of overhead with the organization. So I know that's a concern sometimes with charitable donations. That's not the case here. So keep that in mind. Please consider buying tickets for the raffle, um, supporting the kids over at Soccer in the Streets. And thanks again to Andrew and to the faction for you know, working with us to do this. We're, we're glad to help. We're glad to, to blast it out. And hopefully we can raise even more than we did last year. So all that being said, packed show today. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back, reset everything, get ready for Mike Conti calling in. From Monterey, we'll get the lay of the land. We'll see how cold it is down there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike will be, I believe, heading over to training this evening to see the Estadio and and see what Atlanta United's looking like. And we'll check in about yesterday's travel with Mike at 930. But we'll be right back after this. Today's show is presented by Avalinsky & Associates personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience supporters of atlanta united faction and inter atlanta youth football club if you've been hurt in a wreck contact steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24 7 at 404-377-9191 the initial consultation is free 
A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual insurance company, country preferred insurance company, or country casualty insurance company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome back, Soccer Down Here, Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show. Our buddy Trains with some thoughts, wanting to call me out. I will explain myself, <laughs> Trains. Uh, Trains says, long shoe going into preseason. Shouldn't be too big of a difference coming from Tata's system to DeBoer's. Long shoe now. Team will need, team, need time to adapt to these changes. End the questioning emoji. Going into preseason, Trains, uh, I had no idea that they were going to play a 3-4-3. Nobody did. How could we? So, now seeing a 3-4-3, that is a much bigger difference from Tata's system to Frank DeBoer's. And as I've said many, many times in the midst of this, there are similarities, and that makes it a faster process. Doesn't mean it's overnight. Definitely doesn't mean it's overnight. And I, if that was what was taken from me saying that there are similarities between the two, that it would happen overnight and Frank DeBoer would just step right in, everything would be fine then that's my fault for not being, you know, not explaining it well enough. But going into preseason, I expected them to play a 4-3-3 because that's what Frank DeBoer has played mostly in his career as a manager. That's what he played mostly at Ajax, not exclusively, but mostly. He started experimenting a little more as time went on. That's what I was expecting, and I thought the pieces were okay with that. It's not the case. I also didn't expect some of the the moves around in terms of, of controlling possession. I thought it would be a possession-oriented team, but this is, from what I can tell, where it's headed. And I could be wrong. I am not. Trust me, I am never going to say that I know all of it and I know all of it before it happens. I don't. I don't. I'm telling you what I see and how I'm feeling about it right now. And that changes because things change. Um, sorry, I'm not perfect, and I never claim to be. I expected something different going into preseason. I've seen something different since. And yeah, I think the team will need some time to adapt to those changes. Absolutely. I think they are also missing Franco Escobar. I don't know where he fits in exactly, and that's another thing that's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, Breck Shea has had good and bad moments. It's going to take him some time to integrate into this. He's playing in a different style than he's played. Pitti Martinez being asked to do some different things. He's still building relationships. It's taking some time. It is. Maybe I thought it would be a little clo- a little closer to what Tata did at the end. Maybe I thought it would not be quite as long. Hey, it's showing that it's going to take a little more time. I also did not expect the 3-4-3. That's the biggest thing here is I didn't see that coming. I know some people have said that the 3-4-3 is uncommon I think it's more common now than it's ever been, but it is a formation that does require a lot of time in it to be truly comfortable. I think it's a formation that can suit this team, though. I really do. And I think it's a formation that, to be its best, is going to take that time to to get there. Now, what I'm wondering, and what I've said many times along this path, is 
how flexible can you be early on while you are building this formation and this philosophy and this style of play in your tactical approach in matches? What's the priority at the moment? Is it sacrifice the long-term build of the philosophy for a short-term result or vice versa? I think so far we have seen sacrificing the short-term results to play the way you want to play. Now, this is going to be the biggest test on Wednesday. Can they do both in this match? I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I'm not at every training session, so I don't know. Based off what we saw on Sunday, I think they're going to need to. One, because of just the, the format of the season. I think you'd, you'd like to be a little more conservative Two, it's just being on the road. You generally want to be more conservative on the road. You're happier with a a draw or a a low-scoring affair. You don't want to get blown out in the opening match. So if you're going to play a very bold, taking chances 3-4-3, you could get exposed, and you could go down early, and it's going to be harder to fight back against Monterey than it was against Aridiano. But Trains, if, if I'm... If I'm misleading you or something, that's that's fine. I'm not trying to. I will adjust things based off what I see. I hope I didn't fail you in terms of explaining things early on. Um, I didn't think it would be as big of a difference. I didn't think it'd be a 3-4-3. That's a big difference from what we saw with Tata Martino. Didn't expect it. I was caught by surprise, as I think pretty much everybody else was. Um, that's all I got. Sorry, I'll put my hand up. If you wanna if you wanna blame me for that one, well, I'll try to do better next time. That's all I got. Tafka with a question in relation to the topic somewhat. Is there any word on Franco Escobar's recovery? We're at the seven week mark now. He's just listed as out right now on the injury list. Uh I always thought it was likely for him to return in the international break on the the longer end of it we'll have to see um i haven't heard an update i have not seen him in any kind of sling or apparatus or anything like that so that's a good thing now is he able to train at this point i don't think so because i think there's still worries about contact has he been able to work on fitness probably so and that, that's a good thing. But then you're still, you lost him day one of training. So he's going to have to get caught up on how to play in the system, what his requirements are going to be. That's going to take some time too. So it might be a little more of easing him back in. And also, where's he going to go? What spot is he going to take and who's he going to go in for? Those are uh, some interesting questions that we'll see as we go. Um, we're going to take a break, get Mike Conti on the line. I see I see you, Percy, and I saw that last night. We didn't get a chance to dig into it. I want to dig into that because there's a couple differences in this one to me, and I'll just explain my, where I'm coming from from it. I'm sure uh, Jessica from the Unrelegated podcast will, will chime in as well on, on her thoughts on it because I don't think it's unwritten rules as to what Bill Hamid said. I, I didn't hear it that way. I, I kind of took it a little bit different way. We'll get into it, but we'll get into that in a little bit. We're going to talk to Mike Conti first and get the lay of the land from Monterey. Hang out with us. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. 
He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Soccer down here, March 5th. Uh, so after Trains called me out, he did ask if I was going to do color for the game in Mexico, and I am. I'm flying out at 6 o'clock tonight. But somebody beat me there, uh, Mike Conti, in Monterey. <laughs> What's up? What's Trains calling you out over? I haven't been able to listen in yet. <laughs> well, I've also heard that we shouldn't talk about Trains because that gets weird and everything's weird. So anyway, what I was called out <laughs> on was uh, I said going into preseason that it shouldn't be too big of a difference going from Tata's system to Frank DeBoer's, and now I've mm. said that it's going to take time to adapt to the changes. And one thing I said was that we didn't expect a 3-4-3. You know, you and no. I talked about this a lot. We looked back at Frank's history, and, you know, the 4-3-3 is what we expected. He said he would like to play a 4-3-3. He opted with watching this team and getting into training – to go with this shape based off what he had to work with. It's different. It does take some time. Yeah, and not that you need me to kind of wait in here and defend you, but no, I mean no, when no, did like when, when did you say that you did not expect things to be too dramatically different? If I recall correctly, it was on January 15th when Frank DeBoer gave his introductory press conference here in Atlanta and said, "I'm not going to change much." So um, I got your back on that one. There's that. It's all good. No, I, it's it has changed. And, and yeah. to just take two different things and put them out there, then, yeah, it is. it can look like that. But we didn't expect 3-4-3. We didn't expect big changes. I honestly, in the grand scheme of things, it's not big changes. Big changes to me are what San Jose is going through. Going mm-hmm. from <laughs> whatever you want to call what Michael Starry did uh, basically my bad. saying my bad after losing games to <laughs> Matias Almeida, which is an extremely structured press, high up, man to man everywhere. Big changes would be going to a Red Bulls kind of press. This is not big, big changes, but it is something that does take some time and it will be better over time as the team gets more comfortable in it. Yeah, and also, I mean, if if we're solely looking at what happened against DC United as this referendum on whether or not the changes are working, uh, you were not at a hundred percent there. I mean, Pitti Martinez came off the bench. Julian Gressel came off the bench. Uh, you had Mikey Ambrose starting a white uh, right wing back. That is not going to be your everyday starting eleven once we get fully into. The grind of the MLS season, at least I don't think it will be. We haven't seen Franco Escobar yet. Um, you know, Pitti is probably not fully there at, at 90 minutes match fit yet. We, we haven't seen the, the finished product yet. So I think it's tempting to overreact to what happened Sunday night in D.C. It was by no means great for Atlanta United. But I think you also, as we said Sunday night, Jason and, and John, you have to give fair play to D.C. They're good. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm surprised they looked as good as they did, having really only played together for about 30 minutes in the preseason competitively. They're good. I mean, that's going to be a team right there with Red Bulls and Atlanta United at the end of the year in the East. So with, with, with the quality of opponent and the conditions and being, you know, thrust in the middle of cocky cap Champions League right now, you're going to have nights like you had on Sunday. It does not make for any kind of referendum, in my opinion, on whether or not this 343 is going to work. And, you know, Mike, we also look at what went down at Audi Field, and you, you look at the two goals themselves, and we talked about it on the show last night, that you had one goal that happened off of a corner kick situation that shouldn't have been a corner kick. And yeah. then... The second goal was literally a screwball 
that was hit with the outside of the right foot and then skips off of that turf, which was, you know, wet, slippery, nasty, take your adjective. And then it takes a screwball kick and it turns into a, a bit of a meal for Brad Gazan. So uh, a lot of folks, I think, are reading a lot into things that aren't necessarily there after three matches. And so the, I think that really... If, if you wanted to put a subtitle to this week's programming, it would be, you know, soccer down here, colon, things take time. <laughs> well, I, I agree. And, and honestly, I think no one can really complain too much about the way that Atlanta United defended on Sunday. Certainly can't complain about the way they defended at Kennesaw. Uh, they, they had a very bad first 30 to 40 minutes at Aridiano. Other than that, I think they've been defending pretty well. Uh, if if you want to voice some concerns about uh, this team's ability to convert, especially in the final third, that's valid now. Uh, and it's funny, Jason, I don't know if you saw Joe Patrick's uh, um, chart that he tweeted last night of, of the passing in the final third for Atlanta United, because remember we were talking after the game on Sunday, you know, wow, Atlanta United passed at, what, 86, 88 percent, but it felt like the 12 percent where they weren't converting were all in the final third. Joe Patrick put the map of the passing in the final third, and that must be it <laughs> because I think they were like 120 out of 180 in the final third connecting passes. So that's a problem. I mean, if people want to uh, get concerned or call out anything, Atlanta United's got to be a lot more crisp in the attacking third. But I think for the most part, it's really not that bad. They've defended pretty well. Um, you know, it's just like you said, John, it's going to be one of those things that takes time for it all to come together. Yeah, it dropped down to 73% passing in the final third, and it was 85% overall. Um, Atlanta had about 50, 60 more passes in the final third than D.C. did, and that's that's where when you look a little deeper at it, the, the troubling thing about D.C. is that you had five key passes, you had two shots on goal, and you had that with 56% of the possession, and it was pretty yeah. consistent half-to-half and 85% passing, and that was very consistent half-to-half. You just didn't create anything in the final third, and that's the part that you know, is, is just not acceptable. You have to be able to create chances with this type of possession because otherwise, when you don't finish plays, the, t- uh, the opposing team has an opportunity to break on you and hurt you. That didn't even really happen against D.C., to be perfectly honest. you know, One goal is a set piece, and the other is... An awkward shot that Brad would love to have back. I mean, he'll tell you that. He's not happy with not making that save. But it's an awkward shot of awkward turf, and he lost it. Yeah. Now, by the way, I, I do need to kind of backtrack on my defending remark a little. Set piece defending, uh, especially on the back post. I mean, that's something that, that – that, I mean, that's consistent from when Tata Martino was here. I mean, it, this club has had problems with that for three this years. This one was thing clever. I, if you go back yeah, and look at what they did on this one, I, I'm really impressed with DC's work on it because – you had Luciano Acosta get away from Michael Parkhurst in the middle. He kind of cut from back post into the top of the six. DC had flooded the the near post and kind of used a lot of guys as decoys because Paul Ariola was was behind that group. There were three guys there. It's Acosta and Ariola getting touches on a corner in the eighteen inside the six. That's not what you expect. It was a clever play from D.C. Atlanta didn't handle it well. Yeah, and it was their third set piece in, what, 40 seconds? Right. So, I mean, you give Atlanta a, a little bit of a different look than again. what they had given, too. And, it, again, it was one that, not like we could tell, because it was through the funhouse <laughs> mirror of the windows, but yes. we are, have been told, and we've seen replays, it, it should not have been a corner in the first place. Yeah, well... What are you going to do? I mean, keep it moving now. It's like we said, if you get a resolve here in Mexico uh, tomorrow night, no one is going to be talking about what happened in D.C. anymore because if you get any kind of result down here, I think it goes right to the top of the list uh, with with some of the great results in the history of this club now in its third year. It, it's an enormous opportunity. The attention has been... Very, very noticeable already down here in the short time that we've been here, and I know we can get into it, but I think it's a really, really cool opportunity in front of this club now on Wednesday. So you hit the ground. 
And you mentioned it briefly, but what has the the vibe been like on social media? It's been very warm and welcoming and Mm -hmm. and handshaking and all that kind of stuff. But what has it been like ever since you parachuted in? I know it's a small sample size, but what what has the vibe been like about A, the match itself, and then about B, Atlanta United coming to town? Well, I've never been on tour with a rock band. Uh, I was not (laughs) alive when Elvis was alive. But uh, almost famous, Mike, almost. But this is um, this is something else with Pitti Martinez. Uh, You know, we we get to the airport last night and as soon as we get through customs, uh, there's a throng of River Plate fans there looking for Pitti. Uh, And then kind of similar to the experience, Jason, that we had in Costa Rica, we get out of the terminal, walk to the bus. Uh, there's a large contingent of Mexican media there filming every move. I'm sure it's probably on Facebook Live for, uh, you know, Azteca TV or something like that last night, trying to find where our van was uh, because there were just photographers everywhere. Uh, one difference this time is we had a armed police escort take us from the airport to um, uh, the hotel here in Monterey, which is standard procedure. And, and this is a very safe city, by the way. If you're coming down tomorrow night, You'll have a great time. This is a a beautiful, safe city. Don't worry about any of that. But anyhow, we get to the hotel, uh, and as we go through the lobby, more River fans uh, calling out for PT. Uh, A lot of young women, by the way, calling out for PT, uh, (laughs) wanting (laughs) selfies and autographs and things like that. So um, uh, it's you're right, John. It's been very positive. Uh, It has not been combative. We're going to the Estadio uh, BBVA Ben Comer. Uh, later tonight for training, there will be a press conference there. We'll see what kind of reception we get there. Um, the interesting thing is, and, and Ryan Catney's of Atlanta United's digital team did a great job translating for us last night at dinner. We were talking to a couple of the locals here at dinner last night. Monterey is in the middle of a brutal stretch where they just played Chivas, they play Atlanta, then they play Tigres. Uh, which is huge down here. It's the Monterey Classico. You play Atlanta again, then you play Cholos. So it, 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 it's it's kind of interesting how I think there's been some respect for Atlanta United. There's a knowledge down here. Okay, here comes the MLS champion. But everyone's looking ahead to the, um, I, I forget the Spanish phrase, uh, Prochen Semana or something like that when they play uh, at Tigres because that is, uh, that's the Super Bowl down here in Monterey, as you know. Um, so I'll, I'll be curious to see, you know, they went pretty much all in on this match tomorrow. Diego Alonso did by resting a couple key players, uh, last Saturday night against Chivas and they still got the result. But I'm wondering from the perspective of their supporters, uh, if this match against Atlanta United means as much to them as it may mean to us here in Atlanta with that Tigres match coming up. How do you think Monterey is going to balance this? Because that's that match on Saturday against Tigres is not one that you can go in. You're not allowed to go in with a second choice lineup there. You, you can't. No. It's one versus two in the league table, let alone the rivalry of, of Monterey. This is it's it's a rivalry in in this hemisphere that doesn't get talked about enough because you have Boca River, you have some of the great Brazilian rivalries. Every country has their rivalry. Mexico has a bunch of rivalries because of the the grandes, the big clubs in Mexico. Anytime they face off, you have a rivalry. You have a regional rivalry with Chivas and Club America. You have the Mexico City rivalries. The Monterey one's a little newer, but it's so big. And this year, it's even bigger than maybe it's ever been in regular season with one versus two. I think they might be forced to rotate the squad a little tomorrow night. Yeah, I I, I think they have no choice. Uh, And, you know, I think a lot of people assume that with um, Diego Alonso, not necessarily going second choice, but going with a rotated squad uh, against a mix. Definitely. Chivas, it, it was a mix, but I think a lot of people have assumed that, oh, well, he did that because Atlanta's coming up on Wednesday. Partially true, but I think he did it because Atlanta's coming up on Wednesday, and then you have Tigres coming up right after that. Uh, so he's probably looking at this week that they're in right now, uh, maybe as kind of a 180-minute match with a very long halftime. Mm-hmm. I think, and, and and tell me, guys, if you, you agree or not, I think Alonso probably starts his first-choice group with the hope 
that if they can go out and get a couple quick goals, then you can get a guy like Pabone out of there. Uh, yeah. You can get a guy like Funes Mori out of there. But that's scary for Atlanta United because that could mean you're going to see an onslaught in the first 30 minutes. And, um, and, but the, the dangerous part about that strategy is uh, if that is your strategy and it doesn't work out, well, then you're kind of committed to playing a guy like Pabon until you do get something on the board. And if you don't get it until the 80 or 85th minute, well, then shoot, you know, it, it didn't quite work out. Now you have to worry about this weekend. So it's risky, but if I were to guess, I would think that would be the way he would go. Well, I think when you look at, at what they've done, they're not against rotating really anyway. They, they mm-hmm. rotate in league play. They've played nine matches so far in the league. The only player who started all nine is the goalkeeper, uh, the 35-year-old Marcelo Barrevero. He's the only one. Uh, Nicolas Sanchez, the center back who is very good on set pieces, has scored four goals this season from center back. He had the penalty against Alianza that won it. He started eight. You have two other players who have started eight. Then it's a lot of seven, sixes, fives. You've had rotation. You've had a couple guys who came into the team in January in the transfer window after the league started as well. So I don't think uh, Alonzo's really nailed down to a starting 11 per se. I think the way that we see what Atlanta United could become over some time with a group of about 14, 15 that are interchangeable in a lot of ways, I think Monterey has that now. They don't have a, an exceptionally deep roster. I mean, they, they're they're top heavy. They've got great players, but they have a couple guys out injured right now. Mm-hmm. They only have nineteen outfield players on their first team uh, healthy at the moment, and then the two goalkeepers. Uh, which I mean, obviously, you can get through with that. You can only dress eighteen, but um, Atlanta United. I, I, the one thing you could say that they would have an advantage on. Uh, over Monterey is that they're deeper. And, and that that's kind of why I think, boy, if you could get, I mean, even if you were to lose 2-1 down here, but if you get that road goal, then Monterey's got to deal with everything they have to deal with down here. Atlanta United comes home, plays an expansion team. And I've been working on Cincinnati this morning. They really did not play very well uh, in no. Seattle. Uh, you got an expansion team on Sunday, and then you have Monterey coming in on Wednesday. I really, really like Atlanta United in that spot a lot, but you've just got to kind of duck and cover here. Monterey, by the way, has never lost to an MLS club in CONCACAF Champions League. They're 5 0 1 all time against MLS, 29 3 4 all time in the CONCACAF Champions League they, in this format. They've won it three times. Um, but this is one where I think Atlanta United, boy. Uh, if they could just get through the 90 minutes tomorrow without knocking themselves totally out with like a, a 3-0 or a 4-1 loss, you come back to Atlanta, and I, I really think they would have an advantage based on how their fixtures line up against Monterey's. And Mike, you mentioned it, uh, the not making sure that tomorrow night turns into a horizon job, and you're really having to overwork. And the importance of the road goal. We saw it in the first round of the round of 16 against Arediano. And if you can get your way through to where you put the ball in the back of the net once, or if you keep it close like a one nothing, I think that always viewing this as 180 minutes, and I, think, and I know it's a new thing for some fans to view it in this way, but think of it as two halves. First half is tomorrow. Second half is in a week from now, but road goal or keeping it tight, that's the big those are the big takeaways out of this first go round down there. If it's a one nil loss, we are running to the airport tomorrow night and sprinting on to uh, Swift Air and getting the heck out of here because I mean I know you want to win every match, but one nil here uh, losing one nil would be a, a fantastic result because then you come back home. Uh, you get a 2 nil win and you go through. Or a 1 nil win, you go through. You worry about conceding the road goal then. You, you love to have that road goal in your pocket. But I think we need to look at this somewhat realistically. I mean, Monterey is one of the top two in Mexico right now. Uh, Atlanta United's a little bit wounded after what happened Sunday uh, in very, very heavy match congestion. So I, I, we want to be optimistic, but I think we also need to be a little bit realistic about what they're going into. 
Yeah, it's 180 minutes. And when you look at the last series that Monterey played in the round of 16, it, it took almost all of the 180 minutes for them to find a goal against Alianza from El Salvador. Atlanta United's a stronger team than Alianza. Alianza, I think, is probably the best team out of El Salvador in a long time. They would not be a favorite to win MLS Cup if they played in MLS. I think there are lessons to be learned there. And you're, you're looking at a Monterey team right now that in their last four matches overall in all competitions, they've scored three goals. One was mm-hmm. the penalty against Alianza. Two were long-range bombs from Pabon against Chivas over the weekend. They're struggling to score goals. There is some pressure building because Monterey has a very talented roster that hasn't been hitting on all cylinders just yet. That could help Atlanta United if the pressure mounts tomorrow, if Atlanta can keep them off the board for an extended period of time. Yeah, no doubt about it. And and I think Atlanta United would be capable of doing that uh, because, again, like I said earlier, I think for the most part they've defended pretty well outside of the first half Deridiano. Again, very small sample size. I feel pretty good about this this three-man back line right now. I think Miles Robinson has been maybe Atlanta United's most consistent player so far in the three matches that we've seen. I mean, Parkhurst and LGP, obviously, you know what you have there. Uh, I, I think they're, they're in a good position as far as the work rate they've put in where they can start. You don't have to worry too much about them. Um, you know, I'm not concerned about Atlanta United coming in here and getting blown out. I'd be really surprised if that happened because I think they've defended very well. I think what makes me a little bit nervous is, oh boy, if Monterey got that early quick goal and then you get 55,000 supporters, and there, I, I don't expect there's going to be a lot of Atlanta United help here tomorrow just because of the short notice on which this fixture was set. Boy, if you get those 55,000 supporters really starting to build and grow into the match, you don't really play in atmospheres like that in MLS unless you're playing in Atlanta. <laughs> and then they're rooting yep. for you. Uh, so it, that, that's one thing that makes me nervous. But I, I really do – maybe I'm overly optimistic. I, I do feel pretty well about the way that Atlanta United has been defending up to this point. It's going to be a fun one. Mike, I'll see you tonight when I get on the ground in Mexico, and we'll have soccer down here live from Monterey tomorrow morning as we get you ready on match day. And then we'll be uh, catching a flight back early Thursday. Thursday's show will be an afternoon show because I like yes. to continue to live. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I could handle a morning show on Thursday, not with this week that's yeah. been going on. So it'll be the afternoon drive edition of SDH on Thursday. Traffic Please and weather on the 8th. Give us. That's right. Yes. Uh, and by the way, by the way, pack a coat. It is cold down here. It's... Uh, it's like Seattle weather. It's upper 40s and, and kind of light drizzle. And it's going to be that way again tomorrow, they're saying. So pack right. a coat. I'll adjust the uh, the bag as, after that information. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. All right. Thanks, Mike. I'll see you tonight. See, see you guys. Be We're good. Take a quick break and uh, get ready to have Joe Patrick join us at 10 o'clock. Hang out with us. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apple and Associates personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience supporters of atlanta united faction and inter atlanta youth football club if you've been hurt in a wreck contact steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24 7 at 404-377-9191 the initial consultation is free A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. 
Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Quick segment to end hour number one as we get ready for Joe Patrick to join us to kick off hour number two. Toronto made it official yesterday. Alejandro Posuelo is now a member of the Reds. We knew it was going to happen. It ended up being a little more expensive than we had originally heard. $11.3 million transfer fee, 10 million euro. That's all according to the Belgian media. It's a four-year deal, about $4.5 million per year. It's a huge investment for Toronto into Alejandro Pozuelo. Ali Curtis said he wants to add more players, and these are going to be TAM guys. So to kind of reset where Toronto is right now, Giovinco gone. He was playing as a forward with Josie Altador. Pozuelo is more of a replacement for Victor Vasquez, who was a TAM player playing more as the playmaker behind the forwards. I'm assuming that one of these TAM signings is going to be a forward to play with Josie. So unless you're changing the system, and that's also possible yeah. too. Greg Vanny has shown a little bit of tactical varieties. He's played some 3-5-2. He's played some 4-4-2. Would he go 4-2-3-1? And would he use TAM to go get a winger and play Josie by himself, Posuelo as the 10? I don't know. Um, can Posuelo play as a second forward? Because you do have... Jonathan Osorio and Marky Delgado, along with Michael Bradley in the middle of the field, it's going to be hard to play four central midfielders. I'm curious to see what the next move is to know a little bit more about where Toronto is going to be. Yeah, and th- this seems like, yeah, obviously this is a big first step towards something, but figuring out what that something actually is until they have all the pieces, uh, that's, that's where we're all sitting here going, okay, what's next? Or if you're in the market for a central midfielder, I would be talking to Ali Curtis about Marky Delgado in a big way because I, I think he's going to be the one that's left out if it's Posuelo as a 10, Osorio as an 8, Bradley as a 6. Delgado gets left out unless he can move out to the wing. Um, I would be making some calls because I think Marky Delgado is a starting central midfielder in this league, and I think he is going to be in demand if – Toronto goes to get another forward and does what we're kind of thinking they'll do and stay either 3-5-2 or 4-4-2 diamond. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it unless they're looking 4-4-2 diamond. And, and this is, it gets a little narrow, but Bradley as the six, Osorio and Delgado as eights, Posuelo as a 10. Can you make that work? You're already one game in. It's going to take some time. You're not getting Posuelo until late March. So, We'll see what's up with Toronto, but they spent on Posuelo. They're going to have more TAM to spend. We just don't know in what way. And I'm I'm in very intrigued to see what that means because if they get the right pieces and it comes together, they could push in the Eastern Conference. But I don't know. Giving them the side eye until we see what's next. Let's take a break. Let's get Joe Patrick on the line. We'll get his thoughts on Sunday. We'll get his thoughts on tomorrow night and everything else Atlanta United related. Stay with us. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. 
If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States and the Ad Council. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Pete, y'all. Hour number two, Soccer Down Here, March 5th edition. It's Tuesday Thoughts. If you have thoughts, share them with us on Twitter at Soccer Down Here. Uh, we have already had our thoughts in the break about what the Braves need to do to get back to the playoffs, get back to the postseason with Joe Patrick. Noted baseball expert, Joe Patrick, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, and noted soccer expert as well. So now put take yes. the Braves hat off. Put the okay. Atlanta United. Uh, I'm, you can't wear my Kangol. I'm not going to let you do that. No. One. no. <laughs> uh, you could go beanie maybe. or put the you two, could throw, go, a, throw a scarf on. condition. Yeah, throw the scarf on. There you go. Take the baseball hat off, throw the scarf on, and let's talk about what happened on Sunday. It was not good. Um, It was maybe not as catastrophic as it's been portrayed by some, but it was not good. What would you take out of it on Sunday night? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. You know, the the performance was boring and um, uninspiring. I think that's that's fair to say. Um, But at the same time. Yeah, but at the same time, I don't think that it's like it's unexpected. Um, th- these are the kinds of things that happen when you have a new coach and and you're trying to develop new ideas. You have new players. You have you know one of one of if not the key player that made your team tick is gone, and you're trying to re- figure out how a new great player can replace that role or or, or replace that production and try and try to recreate what he did um, in a bit of a different way. You also have key players like a guy like Breck Shea coming into the team. Um, so you have, you know, you have pieces that are moving and it's just going to take some time for things to settle into place. And then of course, like it can't be um, understated the, the amount of travel and the amount of games the team is playing this early in the season. I mean, I know we like to talk about teams in Europe having to play this congested schedule um, where they're traveling a lot, but they're not traveling the distances that uh, the American team would travel just based on the geographic nature of, of the two continents. And then also they're typically not traveling and playing this congested of a schedule this early in the season. I mean, Atlanta has been going weekend, midweek weekend, you know, two games a week, essentially since the competitive season started. And that's just incredibly difficult from a physical perspective. So I'm not like, I'm not, that's why I'm not super concerned um, about what's happening on the field because the players are just still trying to work out the kinks here. Before we get into my first serious question of the segment, apparently today is Pancake Day. I don't know if it's national, Ooh. international, or otherwise. Your favorite pancake, sir? Uh, it's got to be chocolate chip. It's like a dessert, mm-hmm. but you can okay. you can you can arguably get away with it for breakfast. You know, without well, being. I mean, Getting third, you know, awkward looks. Okay, I just I, I figured I would put that out there, Jason. Pancake day, blueberry. The chocolate okay. chip's good, but yeah, I, I look at that as more dessert than like true pancake. Uh, so blueberry pancakes is where I'm going to go. Okay. Now getting into the the round of eight, Jason and I were talking about the round of eight in the the first segment of the show and how the matchups tonight could present opportunities for at least one MLS side, probably Red Bulls, considering all that Santos Laguna had to go through to actually get to Harrison, New Jersey, and how tough it's going to be for uh, the Dynamo going up against Tigres. Where are you viewing the matchup with Monterey for Atlanta United in leg one? Is it somewhere in the middle between, say, 
what uh, Santos is facing at Red Bulls and what uh, Tigres is facing with Houston. Where on the on the difficulty scale, where are you viewing this particular leg? The difficulty from Atlanta United's perspective or from the Mexican yeah. clubs? Okay, yeah, um, for, yeah for, I would say, the... you know. It's a tough one to pick between Monterey and Tigres. I mean, those are two top, top teams. Um, I think going into Monterey is probably harder. I mean, they're in better form right now. They are, I think they're still leading uh, Liga MX, if I'm not mistaken. If not, they're right up there. And that stadium is just going to be, uh, I think the stadium I, honestly kind of puts it over the edge for me. Not I don't, not in terms of increasing the difficulty, but just the magnitude of the match. Um, it's going to be special. I, I mean, I know that, uh, Frank DeBoer mentioned, you know, called it out after the Herediano match, just saying like it's one of the most beautiful places in the world to play football, and and they can't wait to go down there and do that. And I think that that it's just going to be such an atmosphere. But in terms of the difficulty, um, yeah, I'd put Monterey as, as I mean, this is the pinnacle matchup in I would say the entire tournament. I mean, if it's not like if it wasn't Atlanta Monterey, it would be Atlanta United Tigres would be like the pinnacle matchups. I think that you would that the directors would want to see uh in this tournament so it's hard to distinguish between the two but i think that this is you know as difficult of a matchup as it gets yeah maybe monterey t grace in a final to get that yeah. rivalry in a final of this would be the only other thing that's on the same level uh the attention that this is going to get is going to be big and i think it's going to get bigger coming into the second leg now that you know that, that's pretty typical in these we watch them in Libertadores or Champions League in Europe whatever where you have a lot of buzz going into leg one but leg two it's better defined you know exactly what the situation is going into it and then Monterey is going to be coming off of that big rivalry match against Tigres in the weekend fixtures so I you know what's what's success here in your mind for Atlanta tomorrow night? Is it you know is it must win? Is it must get a result? Is it something else? What do you think the the definition of success is walking off the field tomorrow night? You know, honestly, okay. So first of all, I'll just preface this by saying that my expectations for this game are probably lower than a lot of fans. And I would say if you can get out there, get out of there with scoring a goal. And maybe losing by a goal. I think that that's a fine result to try to... That gives you a legitimate chance. Then you just have to basically win. Um, you know, and we could... You know, the score line would... With the away goals, you know, that would be different based on what the score is. But I think score a goal in Monterey and try to only lose by a goal. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds so uh, negative. But I think that that would honestly be a result that gives Atlanta a, gr- a really great shot to then go and win it in the second leg. Um, and so I, I don't think that people should, you know, a, a draw would be amazing for Atlanta United. Um, any, any kind of result in, in that respect would be incredible. Um, so I think, and especially, you know, just coming off this DC result, I think that part of it is just the mentality of the team. You want to kind of, um, rebound a bit and, and a one, uh, you know, a two, one loss is not a bad result going, going down to Monterey and, having to deal with you know all the stuff that i mentioned earlier about the schedule and 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 the new coach and all that but is a and but i mean honestly but is a 2-1 loss i mean you you think that you're more negative going into this one than a lot of folks but is a one nothing loss is a two not is a 2-1 loss really that negative a negative i don't think so no, yeah, and I agree. Obviously, I agree, but um, I think that that's what kind of people need to understand in, the, in these two leg affairs, and especially with you know um, away goals and all the complexities that go into it. I think that you know it's it's just not like a league game in terms of the res, in terms of looking at the result. You really need to look at the result as what do you have to do then in the second leg that may, that helps you advance or, or or gets you to advance. And I think that you know with a two one loss. Then if you win one nothing, you're through. So um, that and that and that's a very achievable result. So I think that people need to look at it through that lens, not not through the lens of you know you lose the game, so you get nothing out of it. That's just really not how these things are working out. You just have to look at it as this is one half of the game, and this is going to be the more difficult half because you're on the road playing in a hostile environment. So if you can it's if you can scrape through that and keep yourself alive, then that's what that's what you want. Who are you looking to to help make that happen for Atlanta tomorrow? You know, it'll be really interesting because these these starting 11s um, are very difficult to try to predict because of the the heavy schedule. But I think that for Atlanta United, really, 
Um, I think the key comes down to the middle of the park and looking at the two central midfielders, whoever they are. Uh, I don't know if Jeff Lorenowitz is going to step in or if Nagby and Eric Rometty will play once again. They have a lot, a lot of minutes logged there. But I think in this 3-4-3 three, three system, the way it's currently set up, when you, where you really only have two central midfielders, um, those two central midfielders are so important, not just in the way they build up the play, but they're so important in the way that uh, transitions happen because they create the offensive transition oftentimes. And then also they can really put their team in a lurch if they give the ball away in poor positions, which can happen because they are there's only two of them there. And oftentimes in the modern game, they'll be overmatched yeah. against three men in midfield. So it's very important for them to protect the ball and not to create a turnover in the middle of the park where then the other team can immediately be on the break in an advantageous situation. So I think that whoever plays in those two central midfield roles, they're going to have a huge influence over the game. Again, not just for Atlanta United going forward and scoring and, and maintaining possession and playing the way they want to play, but also from a damage prevention type of, of standpoint. Now, I know that we're only three matches in, so I'm not going to ask for a, a full report card or a scale, you know, like rate a record from American Bandstand or anything like that, just to, to use dated references that only folks of Never my heard age of that. group would understand. Yeah. That's <laughs> what I said. Folks of my age demographic would understand this. But, Joe, let me ask you what your overall impressions have been of the, the newer faces that we've seen in the small sample size, like a like a Shea, like a PT, those kinds of individuals, you know, uh, obviously a Miles who's been there. But what have been your overall impressions of the the newer faces here for the 2019 side? Yeah, so I think like I think PT is kind of a, a great example to look at first because he's a player who on the surface hasn't really, you know, produced in terms of goals or assists or things like that. Um, but I still think he's played well when he's been in. I mean, you can see the skill. You can see what he brings to the team. And you can see how that skill would fit in with this Atlanta United squad. I think it's just going to, again, take some time, um, not just for him, but for his teammates, the guys who have been here, Barco, Joseph Martinez, to develop a relationship with one another on the field and understand where the runs are going to be. And that that will make that talent that Pitti Martinez has that will turn into production once those relationships develop. So I'm not discouraged with what I've seen from really any, any of the new players, PT, um, Breck Shea, we obviously saw what he's capable of against Herediano. Um, you know, the game against DC, another thing about it is just the, the field conditions obviously were not, were not great. And you don't want to keep on relying on, on these, uh, you know, excuses. And, and I know Frank DeBoer would not make them because he, he told us it was not an excuse to, to play as poorly as they did in, in Herediano on a, a very much, uh, worse field, worse conditions playing on that field. Um, but I think that you, you need to take that into account. You need to take all the context into account. And I think that Breck Shea, I mean, I think what we've seen from him, we we know his strengths, we know his weaknesses, uh, or we're starting to see them. And we can see how his strengths would, you know, play very well into Atlanta United squad. They just need to make sure that, you know, they're not putting him in positions constantly that make him uncomfortable. If If he can be in a position on the field where he can do what he's best at, then I think they'll get the most out of him. So, you know, I think these players have been great. And like you said, Miles Robinson cannot get enough shout outs. I think he's been, you know, over the course of the three games, he's been Atlanta's best center back um, just on based on those three games alone, the form, the, the pure form. And I think I really think by the end of the year, we'll be looking at him as um, definitely Atlanta United's second best center back maybe even rivaling Leandro Gonzalez Perez. I mean, I don't he's not as as good on the ball but he's definitely improved in that regard and in his one-on-one defending, he's just he's incredible. It's like it's like having a blanket, a warm blanket back there. Um you know he's just going to be able to clean up. So, he's been he seems like a new player, doesn't he? I I would agree. I mean, I don't think it's crazy to think Miles Robinson could be getting mentioned in US men's national team talk. By the end of the season, Uh, I think he has all the tools and he just continues to get better and better with more time. We saw it last year with the twos. We see it this year with the first team. He just looks completely comfortable. Nothing seems to phase him. Uh, I will say he's good. He's always been he's always been a bigger a big guy, you know, and, and, Mm -hmm. and good physically. But even this year, just seeing him up close, he looks more impressive physically. You can tell the work that he's put in in the weight room. Um, he just looks like a, 
a freak. Like he's just he's just very big and muscular and very fit. So it's it, it, I think that lends itself to I, people don't see this because it's behind the curtain. But after every training, the players go in and work out in the gym, you know, and that's what's going to help these younger players develop a lot more and a lot quicker. Um, is having all those facilities there and and it's all it's in a setting where they want to do it you know it's it's right there next to the practice field super easy for them convenient um and hopefully that system with the training ground it will only encourage these guys to keep getting better and better quicker and quicker yeah he's not a player that that just looks good getting off the bus you know he's got the physical tools but he's he's shown as a soccer player that there's been massive development in his time here in Atlanta. Before we go, Joe, looking at week one of MLS, what were some of the big stories for you looking around the rest of the league? You know, I think the biggest one obviously was, um, or the the match I was most interested in was Seattle Cincinnati. Just wanted to see how Cincinnati came out. Obviously they got off to a a really quick start, um, but things really went downhill for them. um, Maybe not unexpectedly. And I'll be interested to see kind of how they, how they stay afloat. It's almost like a, it seems like a Minnesota situation, Minnesota United, um, where, you know, they're just kind of behind the eight ball a bit and we'll see, we'll see if the way that they've constructed their roster will, will kind of keep them out of like embarrassment territory, um, in MLS, but it's going to let, they are very much like us in the sense that they're still trying to come together as a team. So it'll take them a little bit to kind of, until we see fully what Cincinnati is made of. And it will be interesting to see Atlanta United um, play them next week. Uh, I think uh, me referencing Minnesota, I think they look extremely fun. They look like a, um, a much better team than they were. I think a lot of us were expecting them to be a better team with some of the players they brought in. Um, it'll be great to see a full season of Darwin Quintero. Um, thank you for uh, coming from my fantasy league uh, to Darwin. Um <laughs> Yeah, I think that, but that's the thing about Minnesota is that they're fun. They're not just good, but they're attacking and they have real quality in that team. And I think uh, Calvo looks much better as a left back than a center back, which is interesting because I think he prefers to play center back. But um, yeah, I think those those two teams are kind of my big standouts. And then obviously coming from that Cincinnati Seattle game was the whole Jordan Morris story, which was great to hear. So very happy for him, for him as well. I'm I'm hoping that. My my pushing Minnesota at the stage in the season doesn't turn out like Jarrett and San Jose last year, but <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm right there about Minnesota being the team that makes the biggest jump. I I think they're a playoff team this year. I mm-hmm. think one reason they're going to be a lot of fun is that their defense is better, but it's still not great. So they're going to have games like that where they get up three one and then give up a goal, and it's crazy at the end because they're just not secure enough. But that attack is pretty explosive. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me, like, it reminds so as a Tottenham fan, I'm going to bring it back to a Tottenham analogy, uh, like, of, like, Harry Redknapp days, where it's like, you're leaky at the back, but you have quality up front, and it's just, like, a kind of a coin flip, like, put the players out there, make some stuff happen, and then oftentimes it's really, really entertaining to watch. What do you have coming up over at Dirty South Soccer the rest of the week? Ooh, we have a lot, you know, with all these all these matches, we have a ton of content coming out. So I think we have five things publishing this morning by noon. So like one one every hour um, of all kinds of things, whether it's recapping the D.C. or looking ahead to Monterey. We have a conversation. Um, Sydney Hunt interviewed the uh, the Mexican uh, FMF state of mind, I think, is the name of the SB Nation channel um, ahead of. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that would be coming. It may be actually published already. I'm not quite sure. There's so many things going out today. Uh, Also have some uh, North Carolina Courage stuff um, coming this week. So they are getting their preseason started. Always like to kind of mention some of the teams that are not in, you know, not Atlanta Atlanta United, but in the region that we cover. Um, Aaron Bellamy does a great job for us there. So tons of stuff, tons of stuff. We we are not we are not uh, bored or just sitting on our hands. Definitely not. Go follow Dirty South Sock on Twitter, DirtySouthSoccer.com, J.A. Patrick 200 on Twitter for all the latest and some Braves updates, too, because, you know, it's spring training. Things are happening. Yeah. Yeah. Crack of the bats. Everything (laughs) going on down there in Orlando, Joe. (laughs) Not bad. You you do a really good skip. (laughs) Coming up after the Braves game, it's Chud for your movie. Something called Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. Never heard of them. I always I, my favorite thing about Skip Carey was uh, him calling you know a fan from Lithonia, Georgia, come down with that foul ball. Yes. Fan from Lithonia. 
in Section 111. Always new. I mean, you know, well, there amazing. aren't a whole lot of people sitting. Yeah, that was. Yeah. But that was, I mean, that was very. Uh, I think it was very Ernie Harwellish. I think that was where that started. Red Barber, Ernie Harwell, some with something like that. Yeah, it's always fun. Thanks, Joe. We appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break. Get ready for some fantasy updates with the Commish. The Commish is joining us at ten thirty. The leading Commish. Yeah, we got to put an end to that. Maybe he'll give us some hints on how to do it. We're going to take a quick yeah, break. Really. We'll be right back after this. Today's show is presented by Apple and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7. 404 377 9191. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome back. We have updates from listeners in India today, because that <laughs> yeah. happens on a regular basis, although it is it a does. listener that uh, we do know a little bit. Yeah, it's the boss, and she's on assignment for work, and they are, I think, nine and a half hours ahead, so they're pushing eight o'clock in the evening today. So we're in, we're in the evening I'll, slot in India. Yes, we are. So it's, right. uh, so it's the, the, the PM drive that uh, starts at well actually it's it's a little after p.m drive time so it's the, the evening show but yeah so she's listening there for a little slice of home and our pancake day discussion we were wondering about pancake day apparently it's tied directly to it being shrove tuesday also known in commonwealth countries and ireland is pancake tuesday or pancake day it's the day that precedes ash wednesday and it's a movable feast determined by easter and it's the elements that make up the pancake that apparently are the, the reason that it's pancake day that are given up for Lent traditionally. So this isn't one of the ridiculous like, oh, it's chocolate cupcake day. Like there, there's a no, there's no, no, no. This isn't something made by this, this isn't something that's made by you know the commercialization of the event. Oh, it's apple the eggs, fritter flour day. and milk. Yeah. The eggs, flour, and milk that make up the pancake were once popular items for Christians to give up during Lent, which starts on Ash Wednesday, and there are many, and then there are traditions that go with it, but that's where, where it comes from. Amazing. Okay. Well, you learn something on soccer down here occasionally. That's pretty See, cool. This is where we need the, the more you know uh, drop. Yes, definitely that. Uh, Nick Lanfear has a Tuesday thought. He says, we as a fan base are overreacting on what was an overreaction Monday. The first goal in D.C. should have never happened because it should have been a goal kick. Second goal was also a fluke, bad read, and save attempt by Goose. The lads didn't look sharp, but it's early. You know, I mean, I agree. I think there has been a lot of, like, whoa, what happened on Sunday night. And, and I didn't 
get that sense. It was a frustrating night watching it because yeah. it just felt like, okay, everything's good in the defensive third of the field. Okay, everything's good in the middle third of the field. Okay, there's a wall set up at the final third, and Atlanta can't find a way around it or over it. And that was the problem, and that gets frustrating. You know, just looking back at the the three games, obviously the game in Kennesaw is different because you get an early goal, but the match in Aridiano didn't even feel that frustrating because you were creating more chances. You only had three shots on goal there as opposed to two in D.C., but you had more chances, especially in the second half. In D.C., it was just a, a cold, wet, soggy, sloppy, sloshy, just blah, and it never got better and that's maybe where you're look you're you're frustrated and you should be because this is a team that is very very good and i think there's enough so far even as it's building to see that this is a team that's very good and this is a team that i think is better than dc united i think they're they're far better than aridiano i think they're better than cincinnati i think they're better than uh philadelphia coming up and they're better than columbus coming up however Maybe they're not better than them right now, and also you have Monterey in the mix, which is going to be a difficult one. You know, is there going to be a, a Concacaf hangover a little bit after the series, win or lose? It, it's going to be tough. It is managing the whole schedule alongside managing match to match. Um, when you have a match like Sunday, it's natural to question, and it's natural to look at, okay, what went wrong? What can be better? For me, there wasn't any huge dramatic failure in this. It was it was different than that. Um, I hope it gets better. And I want it to get better, especially in the final third. And I think if it does, this is going to look like a dramatically different team, more of what we saw in Kennesaw than what we saw in D.C. Yeah. And... You know, once again, you just, it's, it's about development. We keep mentioning little societies and it's, you, you notice that there are flashes of it where, you know, and we got into the show last night about Eric Grimetti's play and you see things from Eric Grimetti that he's being asked to do and that he is doing that he didn't do last year. I mean, the, the, the entry pass from Remetti to Breck Shea, which created the Joseph goal for me, was a shining example of what Eric Remetti can do. And he's doing it this season, even though he wasn't asked to do it last year. And you have players doing different things that are a part of their skill sets that we haven't seen and that they're, uh, you know, unanticipated. But now that we're seeing them, it's like, okay, they are, you know, they are a part of the toolbox. And so I think we're also getting, early on in the year, we're getting to see what's in players' toolboxes that we may not necessarily have known were there because systems were different last year than they are different, just tweaked this year than opposed to last. So for me, it's, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a patient treasure hunt to see who the, what the players are and what they have and what, they're, what, what they can do physically on the pitch, and you're waiting for Franco Escobar to come back. And so there, there are pieces and parts here that are being filled in and over time, you'll see more of that happening, and then you'll get the uh, you would hope the anticipated result that everybody's paying attention that uh, everybody's looking for when it comes to the 2019 season. We'll see. Let's learn uh, how our fantasy teams are doing, though, going into week two. The commissioner is <laughs> leading the league. Um, we're going to hear how he's leading the league and a little bit yeah, more really? about it. Jason Wright from the Jason Wright Agency joins us after this. Stay with us. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. 
PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Soccer down here. Talking fantasy MLS. We need all the help we can get because we're losing in this man's league. He's the commissioner yeah, of the really? league. Uh, he sponsors the league, and he's beating everybody in the league. That's not how it's supposed <laughs> to go. Jason Wright joins us now. What's up, Jason? Hey, guys. How y'all doing? Doing, doing well. right. Doing well. Um, we're not number one, by the way. Yeah. Well, did you see my tweet yesterday morning? I don't know if you saw uh-huh. it or not, but I, I did. Uh, I woke up. I saw that I was uh, in first in in uh, several of the leagues, and I I almost threw in my resignation because you always want to go out when you're on top, right? You don't want to go out from the bottom. Everybody says you're washed up then. Yeah. And your lead is pretty comfortable, man. I mean, it's you've got a 23 point advantage after one week of this. I got lucky by picking Morris, uh, Jordan Morris. Ah, that was the okay. difference maker, I think. It'll be competitive. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at some of the guys that are behind me and, and gals, and uh, they're they're not far off. And that's the thing. That's that's kind of the fun thing about this this uh, format that they have. I, I don't really love the spring and and fall leagues that they break up. But even in the format, if they played it out one whole season, because it's so long, you can make up the ground. So uh, there was somebody last year, I can't remember who it is off the top of my head, who came in about three weeks in, four weeks in, and was in the top 20 overall, just because they had a really good season once they were in and and could build up the points and, and all that. So I don't expect to sit in this spot i can tell you the the player right behind me andy watkins he's last year he was real competitive he he stayed toward the top the whole season also so he'll he'll give everybody a run for their money for sure so let everybody know how they can join the league because it's it is still early days everybody can get on board with this and there's going to be prizes you know on a weekly basis different things that'll pop up how can people join this league so the first thing to do is to register for the league uh, to get the league code. So this you have to have an, an MLS fantasy account. So you, you, if you don't already have a login at MLS, you need to create that. Then if you'll look on either my Facebook page, Jason Wright Agency, or my Twitter feed, which is Jason Wright A-G-E-N, uh, you'll see, should see a pinned post or tweet that will have a link to the registration page. Once you register, it's just a little bit of information that we need. Uh, it'll automatically send an email to you or to the, to the person registering with a league code. Then you go back to the MLS fantasy portal and you, you click to join a league, and if you'll just put that league code in the search box, it'll bring it right up. But it's a private league, so it's not going to come up. Uh, well, no, I don't think it's private, but you have to have the code to join the league. Uh, 
so that's just the only way that we could possibly track and, and everything and then be able to do prizes through the year and do the sponsorship and all that kind of thing. So it's a pretty simple process. Um, but that, that code is the important thing. There are, I know last year we had a couple of folks that shared the code, which is fine. I have no problem with that at all. I'm, I'm glad to have more people involved in it. But to be eligible for prizes, we have to make sure of a couple of things because we are a regulated industry, be in insurance and in the state of Georgia, um, then people who to be eligible to win a prize, they have to be 18 or over and live in the state of Georgia. So that's the only thing, uh, reason why we need to track everything and, and all that. But if somebody shares the code, uh, that's fine. It just, we won't be able to, to, uh, track them to award any prizes to them or something like that. What was it like for you last year to put this together to see the interaction that we had? Because I think we had over 110 people last year in, in the league in and of itself. But what was it like for you to, to see all of this happen last year with the success that the league had? What was it? What was how cool? I guess the coolness factor, I guess, is kind of what I'm getting at here. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, for me, uh, it, it's just fun to be involved in something else that's soccer related, that's geared toward Atlanta United, uh, that continues to connect me to the community of, of folks that follow Atlanta United. I, I enjoy that part of it. I, I mentioned last year that uh, two of my sons joined fantasy last year. And then I actually have my, my fourth son has joined this year. Uh, and not eligible for prizes. They're they're all too young. But uh, they they it's fun for us to sit around and talk about strategy and talk about different players. And uh, you know, I, they they start off wanting me to tell them who to get, and I want them to learn how to think about it, how to come up with their own ideas and all that. But that part of it is a lot of fun. And then past that, as I see people that I you know will follow on Twitter. I start seeing other people in those tweets and in those, those, uh, those streams of conversations. And I recognize them as being someone that's in the league. And then I can, you know, I just say, Hey, to them, you know, thanks for being involved, whatever it is, but it's, it's fun to get to know people that way too, and start making some additional connections and, and what have you, just to, to see how, people are, are involved and, and connected around this central thing of Atlanta United. So MLS fantasy, you know, it's a little different for people who might be new to it. Don't understand the concepts of it and how it works. Like it's not like your NFL fantasy where it's, it's straight up head to head across the board week after week. You do different things. You also aren't in a draft league. Everybody can have the same roster with a couple exceptions. That's, that's part of the differences here. When you go in and you're thinking about it without giving away your, your secrets or anything here, how do you <laughs> think about strategy of how you're putting your roster together with the, the payroll that you have to work with? Um, I think the, the what I look at is past performance over the, the previous few weeks. And you can find charts out there that shows a player's uh, average points for the season – points you know the last couple of games or whatever how many many points they've scored um, I look at that I, I tend to look at um, uh, the opponent who somebody's playing if, if uh, somebody like this past weekend I stayed from away from all Atlanta United players and, and my concern going into it was uh, kind of like what everybody else thought I thought they were going to do a lot of rotation and and all that and then also when i saw the weather i thought even even then when i had the option i could have brought in somebody late uh once i saw the lineup i thought man the weather's gonna be so bad i I just don't know that i want to mess with anybody there um and and so because i thought of the high rotation i brought in lucho acosta and, and that paid off for me from a fantasy standpoint it stunk for atlanta united but um so I look at that kind of thing. I, I try to look at where people are playing, uh, if it's home, if it's away, if someone's playing uh, a hot team, then I may tend to stay away from those defenders. Just just 
things that kind of make sense, you know. I don't get into the deep dive. I, I know some of the the folks that play, they get in some real deep charts and track things themselves and create spreadsheets. I don't, I don't have time for all that. So a lot of what I do is just kind of gut instinct and, and how I feel about something. And if I think, okay, what are the, the chances that this player or this team will play well against that team and, and things like that. And if I don't feel good about a matchup, then I'll just start looking for other, other matchups that I feel better about, whether it's a strong attack against a weak, back line or a strong back line against a, a, uh, a weak attack. So basically the short version, I guess, is anybody who's playing Orlando and this upcoming week, Atlanta playing at home against Cincinnati. Yeah, I, I will, I will have three Atlanta players. I feel certain <laughs> this, this week, no, no knock on Cincinnati, but, uh, it's kind of like Minnesota, you know, when they first came in, um, you know, it takes time. To, to get things together and, and, and what have you. So you go where the, I go where it has the greatest chance of a, of a big payoff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Against Cincinnati, if Gressel is in that lineup, if, if Joseph is in that lineup, uh, I'm, I'm probably taking those guys because they just have a, a good chance, good chance of adding extra points. And I know that, you know, when you're looking at things, one of the things that is interesting about this league is that you can substitute players up until kickoff of that particular match. It's not just something where it's locked in at the beginning of the weekend. You can constantly tinker with your lineups up until kickoff of a particular match. And I think that that's another interesting aspect of this particular league, where if you're paying attention or if you're sitting in front of your laptop at that last moment and sit there and have buyer's remorse over a previous player, you can go ahead and swap that guy out. Yeah, absolutely. It it does give you flexibility. It, It means that if you want to put more into it, then you can track things. When, when I have time on a weekend, I tend to make some notes and I'll, I'll look at what the game time is and uh, I'll see, you know, the, the, the rosters, the lineups come out about an hour ahead of time. And so I'll just go check the Twitter feed to see if, you know, a roster is on there. Um, this past weekend I had, I'm trying to think of who, who it was. I think it was somebody on LAFC and yeah, they, they weren't in the lineup. And so I, I switched it to somebody else, you know, otherwise I would have gotten zero points out of that, out of that player. So a lot of weekends, you know, I've got kids in sports, uh, you know, it's all sorts of stuff going on. I don't have time to, to follow it that closely, but when I do, you know, I, when I can, I will, but yeah, you can change it up to that point. And it's up until the point of that team starting a couple of years ago, once the first game kicked off, you locked in your lineup for the whole week. And so if you had a double game week and you had a, a team play in on a, on a Tuesday, uh, you know, you, you locked in your lineup from Tuesday to Sunday or whatever it might have been. And so that, that made it a little more strategic but, uh, and a little more risky. But this does give you easier flexibility and, and what have you to have that later, that later start time or cutoff time to make, make roster changes. What are you looking at outside of the Atlanta Cincinnati match for this upcoming weekend? Are there any matchups that you kind of like or don't like potentially? You know what? I haven't even looked at it yet for this week. <laughs> <Let> me, <laughs> I got it open here. Let me scroll down. Um, let's see. Golly. Not really. Um, I mean, there's some action. So you realize what he's doing, Jason. What what, what what he's doing, Jason, is that he's sitting there and he's sandbagging the rest of the league to preserve oh, sure. his own 23-point advantage. That's what he's doing. Of course. <laughs> well, you know, the, if the one I'm seeing right here, if sporting comes out with a top lineup, I might would take some of those players against Philadelphia. I, I don't think Philadelphia, I think that might be a little bit of a lopsided match. Uh, but you look at a lot of these, I mean, Chicago, Orlando, I don't know that that's, there's a lot of imbalance there. New England, Columbus, 
I would expect Columbus to to be more dominant, but I'm not I'm not sure yet. Yeah, and on the road, uh, I don't know. Yeah, you know, RSL and Vancouver, San Jose That's and Minnesota. The one RSL Vancouver is the one that I like RSL players in that matchup. Yeah, them playing at home, I, I probably I'll probably have one or two uh, from there, and, and you know, I haven't looked at how everything ended up this past weekend and, and all that, but um, that might be one to even, I mean, you could go three, you can, this season you can only have three players from a single team. Last season it was four. Right. So, uh, you know, RSL having a, uh, that might be a, a good option for Ramondo in net. I mean, he could, I could see that being a clean sheet option for him, possibility for him. Uh so I don't know. That's that's I haven't taken a lot of look yet at the upcoming week. I mean, with it games not starting until Saturday, this is something that I'll end up looking at Friday night while I'm sitting down with the family watching TV or something. Yeah, RSL Vancouver is the one that I'm probably zeroing in on so far, but I need to dig a little bit deeper once we get through CONCACAF on Wednesday. So we've let everybody know how they can join the league, and please go and do that. Follow all the instructions. Get into the league so we can trash talk during the segment weekly. But if you have <laughs> insurance needs, Jason, let everybody know how they can get a hold of you. Yeah, so you can uh, you can either call us at 678-568-6871, same number that's on the ads uh, for the show. You can hit me up on uh, Twitter, on Facebook with a message. We, we don't do... Uh, you know, a lot of detailed discussions through social media or, or messaging or anything just because it, it gets too complicated. Uh, but we can at least make an initial contact that way with somebody and, and figure out a time that we can talk on the phone for a few minutes and uh, and go from there. So, yeah, just just give us a call. We'd love the opportunity to, to, to talk with folks. And, um, you know, that, that's the thing that I think where it all starts at is just having a conversation. Uh, sometimes it's not in somebody's best interest because of their circumstances or whatever to make a change to us. If that's the case, I'm, I'm simply glad to be a resource for people to help them know what they can do to improve their insurance situation so that they're properly protected, uh, but at the same time getting value from the money that they're spending on on insurance. It, it's kind of a necessary evil uh, for folks, and that's how most folks look at it. I totally get it. Uh, so let's just make sure that what someone is, is choosing to spend their money on is doing what they expect it to do, what they need it to do, and it has that value for them. Well, thanks so much for sponsoring the Fantasy League, giving us all an opportunity to talk about this league deeper and deeper, but also thanks for supporting the show. We couldn't do this stuff without you. So yeah. thanks for signing back on for another year. Yeah. Hey, glad, glad to be involved with you guys and, and uh, appreciate you all letting me talk on this a little bit every now and again and and uh, hope y'all have a great day definitely you too jason jason wright of the jason wright agency commissioner and leader of the soccer down yeah. fantasy league we'll see if we can catch up we're gonna try i'm uh i'm doing okay so far in week one but i did not get on the jordan morris train <sighs> i had nacho piatti i had zlatan i did not get on the jordan i had morris zlatan train. yeah yeah All right, we'll see what we can do going next week. We'll see if we can do a little bit better. But we're going to take a break right now, come back, final segment of the show. If you have any Tuesday thoughts we have not gotten to, please tweet at us at Soccer Down Here, and we'll do that as we wrap up. Hang out with us. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part. 
at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Final segment, wrapping up a Tuesday Thoughts edition of Soccer Down here. Jason Longshore, John Nelson, closing out a packed show. Thanks to Mike Conti for joining us. Thanks to Joe Patrick for joining us. Thanks to Jason Wright for joining us. But we've got some other things to touch on before we wrap up, before I start finishing packing. still have a couple things to do there <laughs> because I've got Coat. to change out the bag. Um, put the heavier coat back in because I had taken it out of the bag. It goes back in and uh, getting ready to hop on a plane tonight to head to Mexico. I will not get a chance because of all that to watch the finales of the She Believes Cup, which I'll be trying to keep up with as best I can. It's this is a tournament that that started. I remember seeing it kind of like, I don't know, this is another friendly tournament you know how much does it really mean well in a world cup year when you get this type of group together it's meaningful um you have four of the best teams in the world on the women's side getting ready for a world cup this summer playing on american soil and and drawing pretty well in the stands which is good to see performance on the field for the u.s two draws Four goals scored, four goals allowed. England and Japan are at the top of the table on four points. Each have won a match, each have drawn a match. Brazil's been the disappointment. They've lost both of their matches, and that's who the U.S. closes out with tonight. If there's a winner in the Japan-England match, which will precede it, they win the tournament. Uh, That match is at 5.15 Eastern time. It's at ussoccer.com to watch U.S. Brazil, 8 o'clock kick on FS1 in the finale. There's been a lot of questions about what what the identity is for the U.S. We talked about it a little bit on last night's show with uh, Jessica Sharman from Soccer in the Streets. I don't know if Jill Ellis is any closer to what that is. And there's been a lot of back and forth in the... USWNT Twitter sphere about is she tinkering? Is she tinkering too much? Is she not tinkering? Is she fine tuning? Two draws on American soil in this tournament, even against top competition, I don't think that's good enough at this stage. No. And you would like to think that with the talent that you have on hand, if you're trying to win a tournament, then what you would do is not tinker and lay something out there and sit there and see what you've got. And I've even seen things about people saying that certain players either aren't being utilized or they're out of position. And uh, I'm seeing more negative discussion than I am discussion period when it comes to the, the women's national team. So once again, I'm raising an eyebrow. I'm, I'm not at full blown concern knowing that the rest of the world is, has been catching up fairly consistently with the women's national team. But right now, you know, two draws, I'm just like, no, that's not acceptable. And you're really going to have to put up a result tonight uh, against Brazil and hope that the, the previous match doesn't give you a tournament champ. And so you still have something akin to a fighting chance the, you know, the, for the remainder of the tournament. So no, I'm, I'm like, no, this is this is not a good sign heading forward 
although I'm still trying to be a little patient or at least exhibit a little patience when it comes to the women's national team. I just think that I have too many questions right now. Uh, look, I'm at full-blown concern. Um, I don't know what some of the ideas that are being worked on are actually going to end up being here. Mallory Pugh playing centrally in this tournament, you are missing Lindsey Horan, and, and you would expect her to roll straight back into that spot. Why turn to Pew? Um, she's been mostly a winger and, and a good winger. Why are you playing her centrally when you have other players uh, who can fill into that role? Caitlin Murray had a great piece at The Athletic, and I agree completely agree with, with Murray here. Samantha Mewis is a player who would make sense to replace Lindsey Horan. I think she's a, the type of player that this team needs, and she's a player who's been doing it in the NWSL. And... This is where I still feel like there's a disconnect. What happens in the NWSL during the season does not affect the national team pool. It's not how it should be. The national team pool can't be this static thing. You have players who are going to be in good form. You have players who are going to be in bad form off their professional game. And this is a newer thing on the women's side, but it, it should not be the case at this point. Samantha Mewis has performed incredibly well leading North Carolina Courage to unparalleled heights in the women's professional game. She should be in the, on the field in this situation. If she doesn't beat out Lindsey Horan or she doesn't beat out um, Rose Lavelle or anybody else in this midfield, okay, fine. But right now, she's the one you should be turning to. It would just make complete sense. Instead of playing somebody out of position, I kind of think Rose Lavelle's playing out of position in this role. I'd like to see her in a different spot. Julie Ertz, you can have questions there. She's played in the back. Now she's playing as a holding midfielder. There, There's so many things that are just, it doesn't feel settled. No. And at this stage, a few months away from the World Cup kicking off, you're not settled in the back. You're not settled in the central midfield. That's kind of the base of your team. That's yeah. the foundation. Like, what? Why? Why are you not settled? Is it injuries? Okay, maybe that's part of it. But you're not responding to the injuries well, and I don't even think if you had gotten if you weren't ha- having these injuries right now, I don't know if you'd be settled. That's the problem. Too much tinkering. Yeah, and I'm just with the World Cup. You know, we're under a hundred days, and you're seeing all of this stuff going on this close to a tournament, and it's for me, it's it's too much. It's too much going on in front of me instead of stability. And you would hope that when you're within three months of a tournament that you've got everything, at least you have an idea as to what you're looking at. I'm seeing a bunch of different ideas, and I don't know what I'm looking at. Well, here's a quote from Megan Rapino after the, the game on Saturday um, about why they're not why they're giving up some of the goals they're giving up. She said, a few more tactical fouls in the middle of the field on some turnovers might be a good idea. I don't know why everyone is so hesitant to hack someone down. You either win the ball in a turnover or you foul, especially when you get into these tight games where counterattacks are going to be huge. Mentioned also a lack of toughness in the mix zone, too many turnovers, and said, if they score a worldie, that's one thing, but these aren't worldies that we're getting scored against us. A player who would give that that steal in the midfield, another one who hasn't been turned to yet is McCall Zervoni, another player from the North Carolina Courage. I'm sorry, when there's a team like the Courage doing what they did last year in dominating uh-huh. the league, why are you not looking at that for some of your, your base and some of your foundation? The players have obviously performed. Samantha Mewis, McCall Zerboni would give you more of that steal. They would also bring that little society that we talk about on the field. They'd bring some continuity into this team and give you a little bit more of a base to build from. Those things are very, very important. I just don't like where this team is defensively right now. And and that's going to be a problem when you're playing top teams. England exploited it. Japan exploited it. France exploited it earlier this year. And for me, they're the favorite going in right now. It's on home soil. I think the French team is is probably the most dynamic women's team in the world right now. They're the favorites. I think the U.S. have a lot of work to do. No, right there with you. Uh, I just, I don't see the U.S. as the favorite. I know that we've been sitting here, at least early on, you know, three, six months ago, we're sitting here saying, okay, the U.S. is in the discussion. 
their you know one ABC or whatever. But no, right now I've got to go to the home side just because of the all the questions that we seem to be getting from the uh, women's national team. And, and I'd love to know if Jill Ellis has picked Paul Riley's brain just about personnel at any aspect in any time of all of this. And if you haven't, go for it. Yeah, because you got players there that have done really well. And in a system that's worked and playing in a style that's worked and they have uh-huh. chemistry. So I, it's just it's something that needs to grow. The The women's national team needs to be better connected to what these players are doing on a weekly basis with their clubs. And right now it feels like two separate worlds that do not overlap. And that just should not be the case. A uh, couple things as we wrap up. The biggest one, we'll get into news on the TV front tomorrow a little more in depth, but there are some strategic things going on as MLS looks at its next major national TV deal beyond the 2022 season. Also, sports gambling is something that Don Garber's been quoted as talking about. It's something that has been consistent from him. MLS is is very interested in what's going on in the sports gambling space. They're very open to it. You could potentially see Red Bull Arena have a a uh, sponsorship, a, a venue sponsorship with a gaming company. That would be a, a bold move in the United States. MLS looks to be at the forefront of this. NBA, I think, has embraced it as well. There's also a uh, league-wide sponsorship with a respected gaming company that's very close on the MLS front. So we'll get into those big, big picture things. But on the MLS front, one thing I wanted to, to say as we wrap up, Giovanni Dos Santos was bought out by the LA Galaxy late in the day on Friday. There was no shenanigans here. I'd love to hear the backstory because I think there is one. I don't think reporters like Paul Tenorio, Sam Stashkal were at all wrong in saying that the Galaxy are fighting this. They think that the league's going to allow it. They're pushing for the league to allow a restructured deal for Giovanni Dos Santos. I think the fact that it came out very late in the day on Friday showed that they fought it and fought it and fought it, and the league held, held their ground and held firm, and they have to be commended for that. There's a lot of other things you can criticize the league on. You can ask for things to get better, but they did the right thing here from a competitive integrity standpoint, and that's, that needs to be mentioned and it needs to be celebrated. It doesn't need to be swept under the rug. It also, I think, some of the comments from people about, oh, it was all much ado about nothing. No, I don't think it was. This was a very important thing for the league to get right, and they did. And they forced the Galaxy to follow the rules as they are written and as they are meant to be followed, even the the ideas behind it. They didn't allow any wiggle room here. The Galaxy had to buy Giovanni Dos Santos out and remove him from the roster to be roster compliant, and they did that. That's a credit to the league and I think where it's going, and that's a good thing. Now the discussion can take place. More designated players or more allocation money or however it gets sorted out, now you see. Look, there are teams who want to do more, Allow them to do more within the space of the rules. Don't let them break the rules. The league did that. That's a good thing. There's other things that we can get into about the league and lots of complicated things going on, but they got this one right, and they got it right at a time they had to get it right. This is good. It's a good thing going forward. With that being said, um, that's it. That's it for, sh- for today. Tuesday thoughts are over. Wall Pass Wednesday is tomorrow, and two of us, uh, Mike Conti will be joining for the whole show, will be in Mexico. John will be here in Atlanta holding down the fort for SDH here. He'll be on as well for the full time. We'll get you ready for Atlanta Monterey. We'll also recap day one of the CONCACAF Champions League quarterfinals. You have two games tonight. Red Bull Arena as New York hosts Santos Laguna. 10 o'clock tonight, Houston Dynamo hosting Tigres. Both interesting matchups. Can MLS teams, these two on home soil, can they get results that can hold up in the second leg on Mexican soil next week? I feel better about New York doing it than Houston. I wouldn't rule out Houston doing it, but I'm just not sure. Let's see if Wilmer Cabrera can pull up maybe the best match of his tenure with the Dynamo. Let's see if Chris Armas can handle a very intense situation. He's got an opportunity because Santos had a lot of travel difficulties. Can they take advantage? We'll have to wait tonight and see. You can watch those uh, tonight on Yahoo Sports streaming in English. 
I'm not sure if those are on Univision Deportes or not. Let's see before we go. I want to give you the correct information. Scrolling down. Uh, the first one is Santos Laguna and Red Bulls is at 755 on Univision Deportes. The second one is only on Yahoo Sports due to uh, Liga Emeki's action tonight, Nakaxa and Emetica. So there's your TV plans for the evening. We'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll talk about Atlanta Monterey. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for all the interaction today. Thanks for the tweets. We really, really appreciate it. And I'll be talking to you from Mexico tomorrow. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha fantasy league, y'all.